Well, I have to have to tell you that uh, the the ad that they put on the screen there. Um, I have to apologize that my other shirt was dirty, so I had to wear the same one that's on the on the slide. Uh, but that's not not here and there. But anyway, we're starting right now, rooted and grounded in love. Um, I'll, I'll say that I have, have not copied this out of a book or anything. This is uh, divinely inspired by the Lord and, and Michelle. Uh, I, just, she just helped me, okay? Um, a lot. But uh, I've never set out to do a series before. I've, I've always had more than I could get in one session and had to split it up. But it was never intentional to make it a series, so uh, this is a first for me. I really don't have any idea how long it'll go. I expect for four weeks. Uh, we'll see. Um, but several weeks ago, we were sitting around uh, in the living room of our house uh, just discussing some things that we felt God was drawing us into. And... Uh, Someone who, who was there with us said, uh, we, what we really need is some serious teaching and review on the love of God. And when that was spoken, almost immediately, all these things started just flipping through, I guess, my spirit and my head. Uh, all these things, and, and it happened to Michelle, too. She uh, started writing things down, and, and we looked at them, and it's like, yeah, that's the same thing that I've got. Um, so we began praying about it and thinking about it, and uh, we carefully, we, we chose the word or the name of it, Rooted and Grounded in Love. I know that's just real original, uh, but uh, we chose it carefully because it means something. It means a lot to be rooted and grounded in something. And both are vitally important aspects that are very necessary for maturity in love. Um, I've got quite a few scriptures, but uh, some of them I'll have you turn to, some of them I won't. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm going to look at Ephesians 3.17. And uh, this, is, this is number one. Hey, look at there. It worked. Uh, the title, oh, let's see, and I've already done that. Uh, Ephesians 3.17. Now, now, Paul started at the beginning of the chapter telling the Ephesians how he prays for them has gone through the first 16 verses mentioning all those things. I thank God for this, and I thank God for that, and I pray this and that. But in verse 17, Paul continues and says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of God or the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that means you can't understand it, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, so we're going to talk a, a, a little bit about being rooted and grounded in love. We're going to start with being rooted. When you root a plant, root, root is a verb in this instance here. When you root a plant, you put it in something that causes it to put out roots. Yeah, we're ready for the next, next one. Um, have, you ever, have you ever done the avocado thing where you... When you're through with the, the uh, avocado, you stick the toothpicks in the seed, and you stick it in a uh, glass of water, set it up in your kitchen window, and in a day or two, here comes the, the roots start sprouting out of the bottom of it, if you got it turned right. We did that about every two months around our house, because that's the only time we ever bought avocados, was when mom made her famous, um, she called them tacos tacos. She made them her own way. It was, it was, 
Not like anything you will ever find in any restaurant anywhere. But that's what she called them, and she put avocado in the salad that went on the tacos. Uh, and that's the only time that we've ever had avocados was when she did that, and that was on probably about a two-month, uh, two- or three-month rotation. Uh, that and the fried Spam and the fried bologna. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of us, and there was uh, those, those uh, food, food dollars had to be stretched. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, as the root system is being established, you're able to put those roots in the soil once they start getting, getting long enough and deep enough. Uh, so it's building within it. it. So it started on the inside of the seed, and it's coming out, building within it a system that causes it to draw on the soil in which it's planted. Once you put it over in the dirt and uh, you start taking care of it, I have to say that out of all the years that we did that, we never once got a bush, tree, or anything <laughs> associated with a mature or even semi. I don't know. I don't know if the water went bad and we just threw it out. Or, but uh, I, I never saw anything. I saw some roots coming, but then it's like it disappeared from the windowsill, and I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> Mom said, fooey with it, and psh, out it went. But being rooted means that it solely draws its nourishment from the soil that it is planted in. And you, okay, we should be on number four now. Being rooted in love means you draw your nourishment from the love of God and you take on the nature of love. Because that's what you're planted in, you're drawing up. Those nutrients, those that uh, the sustenance from the dirt, just like the avocado seed does from the dirt, we draw up from the love of God. Uh, now let's talk about being grounded. Uh, I believe that's G1. Uh, this is where you choose to put your roots deeply into love. It is a choice. God is not going to drag you to the dirt and say, get down in there, get, 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 get. No, this is a choice. Deeply in love. Grounded implies a specific location from which you do not move. That means you are steadfast. You're immovable. You do not move. The Greek word for grounded here in Ephesians 3.17 means to lay a foundation for or to settle. You don't see trees wandering around the yard. Once they are rooted and they are grounded, they stay there unless an ice storm comes along and scatters them all over the yard as in last week or two weeks ago. Uh, but typically, they stay put. They are steadfast in that grounding. Uh, being grounded in love is a choice. You don't go from this to that to something else to something else. You, you stay grounded in love. Uh, the next thing about being grounded, and this is G2, the roots are there to help keep you from being blown about by the wind. Uh, they will keep you secure and steady. So not only do they provide the nourishment, they, they receive the nourishment from the soil, but they also uh, become or provide strength for the, for the whole plant. So the deeper and the bigger the root goes down into the, the soil, the stronger the plant is and it has the strength to bear the fruit that is that it is automatically going to produce because on day three of creation I think it was three maybe four 
when God said, let there be all this plants and vegetation and stuff, he put the seed in them. He actually said, with the seed in them. So everything has a seed. Anything that is alive and growing has a seed. And that seed will bear fruit. It will bear fruit. And if the plant is emaciated and not very strong, the weight of the fruit could destroy the tree or could destroy the plant. So you you got to have a good, uh, deep foundation. Um, we have to be firmly rooted, drawing sustenance and nourishment from the soil and grounded, being able to withstand the wind, the rain, the hot and the cold, being grounded allows you to keep drawing sustenance even while, and this is a, a kind of an important part here, you're drawing sustenance from the soil even while above ground everything seems to be blowing in every direction. You're still connected into that love of God. And you can still be fed, you can still uh, be growing in the love of God while the things above the ground uh, seems like they're in a turmoil. Seems like they're, uh, they're not going to make it, but they do. The next thing about being grounded is influence. And this is G3. When you are grounded, what you are taking in from the soil is more influential on your life than what happens above the ground or in the natural world that you live in. Uh, sort of, uh, and this may sound familiar to some of you, not looking at the things which are seen, but only looking at what is not seen. Uh, hopefully on your tree, your plant or bush or whatever, you don't see the roots because they're supposed to be underground. They're supposed to be drawing nourishment from the soil. So you don't see those, but you do see the evidence of what is growing underground. Uh, the roots you cannot see affect you more than what you can see. Your roots are drawing on love, and that love influences you more than the things that happen to you during the day. Let me probably say here it should influence you more what what's growing on underneath the the surface should influence you more than what's growing on the surface um what 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 is it, what is up on the up on the surface could be a fence uh, that's not, I'm not talking about a three rail thing, boundary. I'm talking about offense, offense, challenges and frustration. Those things, sometimes they, they just hit us. We can't help get slapped by those things. But if our roots are good, then we are less impacted. Anything that you would see in the natural is not as impactive on your life as the sustenance and the nourishment that you draw from the soil, from the love that you have been rooted in. You draw from the soil and you receive the nutrients and sustenance from the love that you have been rooted in. The most influential factor in your existence is the love of God. And you are rooted and grounded in and not the external circumstances or situations above ground. Another aspect of being rooted and grounded in love is that any plant draws influence of the flavor and the kind of soil that it is in. If it's planted in soil that has a lot of other plants around it, such as herbs or spices, uh, it'll, it'll sneak some of the, that influence into your plant. It will draw the flavor of those things that are around it 
and that will make it different from the same plant planted maybe 50 or 100 miles away. It's the same plant, you can even come out of the same seed or whatever, but it's, they're going to be slightly different because of what the soil uh, they're planted in has in it. The roots take on the essence of what it takes in. Uh, on that note, do you know that you can control, to some extent, the color of hydrangeas in your flower beds by putting a rusty nail down beside your, your bush, your hydrangea? Now, Michelle says that her dad used to do this. He would push rusty nails down in the in the flower bed and what would normally be a pink hydrangea would come out blue. It would just turn blue because then it has something to do with the acidic breakdown of the soil and the rust on the nail and the iron content and all that stuff and the aluminum and there's articles after articles on online that explain that. It, it is a thing. Uh, <clears throat> So the, the plant, what's above ground, is reflective of the type of soil that it's planted in. And then we're talking about being rooted and grounded in love. And not just love, but the love of God. The love of God. Our lives change when we, when we alter what we have taken in. And I spelt that word alter, A-L-T-A-R. When we alter, when we put on the altar, uh, it, it changes our, our will, our, our plans, then uh, what, what we're planted in can change us. And I, along with Paul, pray that you all would be rooted and grounded in the perfect love of God so that his love would be what is displayed at all times. So that his love is what displayed at all times. His love is what you see above ground as we are planted in the ground of his love. Now we're going to talk a little bit more. You can, you can turn those slides off. We, that's all the slides that we had for that. Um, but I, I said a little earlier, talking about being rooted and grounded, that we would be filled with the fullness of God. Uh, sounds a little bit familiar, or it should sound familiar. If uh, you want to look at Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 12, um, Paul says the fivefold offices were given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ is the perfecting of our ability to walk in and manifest the love of God. Because in Christ was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now there's, there's algebra in, the, in this stuff here. There's a lot of equals and if this equals this then, you know, if A a equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Um, there's a lot of that. The fullness that is in Christ is the fullness that we, well, let me read this again, that we attain as we mature into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ is 100% God, 100% the Holy Spirit, 100% Jesus the Son. It's not a, a portion of the Father and a portion of the Holy Spirit and a portion. No, all three. 
the, the fullness of the Godhead lived bodily in Jesus. So as we become, as we start maturing and we're becoming mature in the love of God, then we are growing into that measure of the stature of Christ, which is the end result. That's what, that's what Jesus wanted. That's why he sent the apostle, the, the uh, pastor, the preacher, the teacher, and the evangelist. In Christ, well, I've already said that, uh, and it's, it's all so intertwined, all intertwined. You know, if you could do a flow chart, uh, it would be a circle. I don't know if you can have a, a circular flow chart. I know Excel doesn't like circular stuff, but um, it would be a large circle because God extends his love to us. We become rooted and grounded in his love, and then we work to teach and train and to bring the body into the full measure of Jesus, which is the manifestation of the Godhead, which brings us right back around to the love of God, which we are rooted and grounded in. So we, we start with the, the drawing of God's love, and then we become rooted in his love, and then we grow and we teach others how to be rooted and grounded. And then we become more mature as we go along. And then it just starts all over again as we mature and we come to the full measure of Jesus. Then we start over again on another layer. We'll never have all of it um, just because we're human and we got holes that things leak out of. But uh, we can keep continually being filled uh, with the love of God. The Phillips translation of Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know for yourself that love so far beyond our comprehension. It's one of those things that we really can't comprehend. We can't, in our finite mind, we can't even understand God. We have to diligently seek God and uh, allow what he expresses to us in his word, by his spirit, through prayer. We have to accept those things by faith. We know that he is true. We know that he is right, that he is holy, that he is just. All the things that we know about him and continually that, that we can't, um, exhaust all the attributes and all the, the good things of God uh, because they just keep there, there's layers upon layers upon layers and uh, sometimes our mind just I just can't comprehend some of the things that, that uh, he has for us it says that it hasn't even entered into our heart eye has not seen, ear has not heard and it hasn't even entered into our hearts the things that God has prepared for us. We can't grasp it, but by faith and in the fullness of Christ, we can walk in it. That's what we're looking for. In the fullness of Christ. Now, I've, I've got some more here to go through. But first, I want to kind of whet your appetite a little bit and let you know some of the ideas that that we had that was started bubbling up in our spirit when we started talking about this. Uh, things that we'll explore, we'll start exploring. Uh, well, a couple of them we've already talked about. But uh, every, every Sunday, every session, we'll have some more things to, uh, different veins and things to talk about. Uh, that we must go deeper than ever before in love. Like I say, there, there's never... A place where we say okay we have arrived we are there no there's always more there's always more faith works by love the world will know us by our love and then we're going to talk about how do we love God if we can't explain it and we can't understand it how do we do it there's a way how do we love one another 
That's a harder way. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, how do we love the lost? And how do we love the sheep that have gone astray? How does God love us? These are there's so, there's so much and so 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 much info uh, that we need a revelation that we need on these things. Jesus said, "If you love me, you'll do something." We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the story of Hosea. How many of you have ever studied the life of Hosea? Yeah, it's uh, it's a wow. Uh, we'll, it's unconditional love. Unconditional love. Uh, a proper understanding of each word used in Corinthians to describe love. Uh, you know, and we'll we'll mention those briefly at the end here this morning. But all the things it's love is patient. Love is kind. But what do, what do those things really mean? What does it really mean to be patient? What does it mean to be kind? We'll talk about those things. Uh, and we'll talk about what moved Jesus to perform miracles. If God is love and in Jesus dwelt the fullness of God, and we are to grow into the fullness of Jesus, then we must become, become not just have, but we ourselves become love. We can only love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So how do we love others? And how do we love ourselves? What manner of love is it the, that the Father had toward us? We'll try our best to describe and to learn about the, man, the great manner of love. We'll, we'll talk about no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. And because of his great love. And then an obscure verse in uh, John. For God so loved the world. We're going to dig into that and talk about that. We'll talk about First John 4. Which we sang a while ago. I don't know about y'all but every time we sing that I want to put that. First John 4, 7, and 8 on the end of it. Have you ever learned that way? Yeah. yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's just the scripture reference. It just sounds a little corny. Uh, but we'll also look at John 15, 12, John 13, and 34, which Jesus says a new commandment, a new commandment. And we'll learn how to love like Jesus loves. I'm going to try to get all these things included in this series, but not necessarily in the order that I just read them. Uh, a lot of them go together with another set. And we'll put those together and try to make a complete teaching out of, of each se uh, section there. But this was just a, uh, I call it a spirit storm as opposed to a brainstorm, because it, it wasn't up here, it was in here, uh, when the word love was mentioned. And of course, not being in any order, the big question was, how do you start this thing? So uh, we, we spent a lot of time looking at being rooted and grounded, because that's, that's going to be the, the bottom line, the 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 most important thing is that we stay in the love of God and that what we see on the outside is a reflection of what's going on under the surface and not the other way around. And it, it should be good what people are seeing on the outside. <clears throat> so trying to figure out where do we start all this after the rooting and grounding and much pondering and praying I uh, felt that it would be good to start with love himself uh, our father God 
So I'm going to talk just a little bit about that, and then we'll be done for today. Before the beginning of time, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dwelt as one. In the creation account, we notice the scriptures say, And God said, Let there be light, water, dry land, trees, vegetations, all the animals. He said, Let there be, let this happen, let this happen, let this happen. But when it came time for the entrance of man on the scene, God said, let us make man, make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Those are animals, not people. But the us here that they used, which is plural, was the fullness of the Godhead Trinity. So man was made in the image and likeness of the Godhead with the capacity for and ability to return love back to the source of love. The, we have the ability to return love back to the source. Now I'm going to jump over to 1 John 4, 7 and 8, our beloved scripture. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. And this last line is the one that I want to talk about for a minute. God is love. I'm not telling you all anything you don't, haven't heard. As we read a little bit ago in Ephesians, it's a little hard sometimes for our finite minds to comprehend anything about God. But along with being love, God also never changes. We know he never changes. This means that if he ever was love, he has always been love and forever will be love. He changes not. He was love in creation. He was love through the cross. And he is still love today. We will find out more about that, what that means in just a minute. We're going to take a stab at defining love in a little bit and, and try to get some understanding. But because God and love are synonymous, it's another one of those things that's hard to comprehend. Especially since love is the totality of Christianity. If you think about it, the kingdom of God, or if you try to separate love from Christianity, is like trying to separate the kingdom of God from, from the king, from God. If you take away love, we have nothing but another dry, dead religion. You can't separate. So love is the basis and the, the very foundation of, you know, we even, we say that uh, our foundation is faith. Well, faith works by love. So there again, you can't, you can't get past love. God's love for us, our love for him, and our love for each other. Everything starts, works, and ends with love. So I know it sounds like I'm jumping around, but we're going back to the beginning again. Here we go. When God spoke about let us make man in our image and likeness, it was love that said that. It was love that wanted to create the earth and everything in it. It was love that wanted to give the earth to someone that was also capable of giving love back to the creator. It was love that could see down through time and see what would happen and know that it would take a part of himself to come and suffer and die so that all that was created could be restored. He saw all that before he even started. It was love that knew those consequences and yet 
They made man anyway. They knew it would cost them. The Godhead knew it would cost them, but they did it anyway. This is the greatest example of love. So what exactly is love? Most of us have heard that there are three kinds of love. Some say four, but mostly three. But I believe that there's really only one since they all came from God. Now there's expressions of each one, but there are, they, they, it all comes from God. You know, there's places all through the Bible that says, if it's here, if you can see it, if you can touch it, if you can think it, it's from God because he created everything. Nothing that we see was, no, everything that we see was created by God and created for God and created for us. So we, we're not going to look too much at the, the other names given for the, those other attributes such as Eros and, and Philea, ph Philea. It reminds me too much of the Philadelphia Eagles, so I don't really go that way. For the, I, I, I am in agreement with, Phil, with brotherly love. I love, that's it. Okay. They all came from God. They all came from God. So the highest word of love is agape. Uh, that's, uh, we know that's a, a Greek word, and uh, it means the, the God kind of love. That's the simplest. It's the God kind of love. It's the most often crowned as the highest form of Christian love. And it is the kind of love and action that shows empathy, extends the desire for good of the beloved. It wants the best extends help or demonstrates good intentions and is intended for everyone, not just the people who take baths on Saturday. Everyone, everyone, the love of God is intended. Agape love is sacrificial. It's the selfless, unconditional type of love that helps people to forgive one another and respect one another, and serve one another day in and day out. The best place to find a list, if you will, of the attributes of love start right here in Genesis 1, and they go all the way to Revelation 22, because you can't separate God from love, and you can't separate God from his word. So anywhere there is, and God said, that's love talking. It's love talking. You say, what about all those wars and, and things they did in the Old Testament? If God said it, it's love. It came from love. Uh, that's one of those things we, maybe we don't, we don't know, we can't figure it out. But we know that it's love because he said so. Everything between Genesis and Revelation starts, sustained, and finished by love. Well, that's the word of God, and nothing can supersede or outrank God's word. So, you know, if love has to take a back seat, just too bad. Because the, the word is the word, and the word is faith, and, and, and uh, no, no. You, you're right in all that, but do you remember just a few minutes ago when I read in his word that God is love? Guess what? He is his word also. They cannot be separated. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So everything that God has said originated and proceeded out of love. What is the one thing that is necessary to please and literally become a child of God? Faith. Okay? Hebrews eleven sixteen, and without faith it is impossible to please God, 
because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And then we go to Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. You have to have the word to believe because faith comes by hearing the word. But not just any word. Okay? The, the, the Bible is full of words. But it's not just any word. But by the word of Christ, it says in verse 17 of Romans 10. By the word of Christ or the anointing revealed. So when the anointing is revealed, that's the rhema. When it's alive, it's presented to you, that is the word of God. It creates faith. And the word of Christ, which is the same as the word of God, is motivated by the love of God. It is the love of God that causes faith to work. Galatians 5 and 6, and the kindness of or love of God that leads men to repentance. <clears throat> that's, I believe that's Romans 2, 4. It's the kindness or love of God that leads men to repentance. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that, and, and we know that that word for world actually means the cosmos, which is, the orderly arrangement and decoration of the world, including the inhabitants thereof. That's what the, the definition that I saw uh, of the cosmos was the orderly arrangement and decoration of the world, including the inhabitants thereof. And God so loved that that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever... Whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is God's love that provides the way, the grace, the faith, and the invitation for mankind to repent from sin and turn toward righteousness and salvation. It all started, is sustained, and will always be because of the love of God. The love of God. So he draws, he provides the grace, he provides the faith to believe it. He provides uh, all that is needed for man to come to him. To turn from sin, to repent, and to embrace righteousness and salvation. So for now... Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, we will probably do this at the end of every session uh, or lesson. But I, I want you all to, to help me with this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to re recite the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read it. And I would like for everyone to read it along with me out loud. Can we stay together and do that? Okay. Then next week we'll start digging in to see how those attributes should be affecting us. So if you would, stand up. I've provided the words here. Yeah, the, we're, we're going to use this translation. I think... Huh? NASB? Okay, thank you. Y'all ready? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries 
and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen. I am not opposed. If y'all want to study that whole chapter, just keep reading it over and over and over. That's what we're going to do from now, or for the next several sessions anyway. We're, we're staying with that chapter, and we will dig it, dig it, dig it. Dig in it, get it all over us, in our hair and everywhere else. And we are going to know the love of God. Because all that's under underneath needs to be showing on top. Yes, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together in your presence. We thank you for your love. The love that passes all understanding. The love that supersedes our mental ability. Father, I thank you that your love never fails. And that you are always leading us and guiding us and teaching us of Jesus, our Redeemer, and the love that it took for him to die for us. Father, we thank you. I thank you for all the ones that are here this morning, those watching by live stream. And I bless your name, Father God, for their lives, for, for their, everything that, that you have done in their lives. I am grateful, Father. And I thank you that you are continually leading us in truth, triumph, and victory because of your Holy Spirit and revealing the plan that you have for us, each one of us collectively and individually. Thank you, Father God. Now I bless your people, and I say that they are the sweet-smelling aroma of your presence. They are the flowers that grow in, in the garden, and, and they bring the aroma and the essence of your love. And Father, I thank you that they are surrounded with favor, that they are blessed in coming in and going out, and that you are for them in every situation, every circumstances. You have our back, Father, and we thank you for that. And I call your people blessed, and whom you have blessed, Father God, none can curse. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, uh, be sure to watch the Wednesday night online. Pastor Michelle has uh, got her uh, teaching on the family, and then we'll be back here next week.